Also die Art Kost in dem Sinne. Drei Baby Change, denn bevor drei Baby Change, die Kuse in die Kost. Aber ich habe noch keine Kost, aber ich habe noch keine Kost. Ich habe noch keine Kost. Ich habe noch keine Kost. So, ich habe noch keine Kost. Ich habe noch keine Kost. Ich habe noch keine Kost. Okay. 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 As we practice every day, is to try and prevent any complication that may take place. And to do that, we try to recognize the problem and then try and prevent it. Why? Because we want to make sure that the baby that that mother is carrying is born healthy and well and able to get to its full genetic potential. You all in here. We are lucky that we are born healthy, and we are all here achieving our own genetic potential. But it was because we were lucky to have a, a healthy pregnancy and delivery. I know some of you are writing profusely. If you don't want to, you don't have to do it. If you beg Dr. Woda, I can give him the presentation and he can print it in his office and give to you. Or madam has a computer and a printer in the office, I'll give the lecture notes and they can print them and give them to you. It's free. Now, you know this. Everything is the same. You've learned all this. I'm just putting it in a different format. We all know that you have pregnant women. The way to think about it, from the moment of pregnancy until soon after birth, is that there can be a problem. And that's all I'm trying to tell you. Try and recognize the problem. Do something if you can. You may not be able to do anything about it. But do something if you can to prevent it. Which means if you are in the community, in the Sabuli or Tugo or Yaka, you may say, oh, this is beyond my uh, competence. I recognize that this mother has high blood pressure, but I cannot prescribe anti I better call Dr. Oda or send a woman
spirit, uh, a straw or a tube into it so that it's submerged with the water by five centimeters below the water. But the amount of water you add is the pressure that is generous. And as long as you can get that connected to TVs and people can do this with, it will be fine. But I would say the best thing to do is if you're interested, come to the NRC. We will demonstrate it to you. Stand up in the intensive care, neonatal intensive care units. The good majority of the patients will be in this category. That's what I said. They only account for 1% of your deliveries, but 90% of your headache, and 90% of your cost, and everything else, most of it is your time. Simply because they have problems that are likely to lead to their death. And we are planning, or not me, but the whole idea in Ghana Health Services and the world is to reduce neonatal mortality. And as you will see in another presentation, all the neonatal mortality babies who die in the newborn period, most of them die in the first week of life, and it's due to these three problems, asphyxia, intrauterine infection, and respiratory distress syndrome. So if you can prevent the asphyxia, perhaps we talked about rapture membranes, if that mother is referred to Jirapa, or if you can do, if you are allowed to do it, you start this mother on a broad spectrum antibiotic, whether it's oral or injection of gentamicin or something like that, you will save that mother's life and the baby's life. Because the mother will not have postpartum sepsis or proper sepsis, and the baby will also be saved. Simple thing, right? Well, it's one of these laws of physics. The surface body, which is your skin, all over your body, is measured relative to your body weight. So if we steal out the whole skin of the baby, put it on the table or on the floor, and look at the body size, and then you come up here with my skin, you put it over here, you put my body next to it, and you will multiply or divide, you will find that my skin is small for my body relative to the baby. Skin is going to be larger for his little, baby, his little body. So that's the surface energy. And the problem there, of course, is you can say I'm sweating. I'm not sweating. So I'm losing fluid and heat. If I have a large surface area, I'm going to lose more fluid and more heat than somebody who doesn't have that. So basically, the answer to your question is it's not just it's, it's a mathematical or a scientific equation that says the smaller the size, the greater the surface area of that person with an impact scale. You get the support of the small decisions area. And therefore, as you know, when you, they talk, talk to you and say you should, I said the baby comes out, you should dry it and warm it and you can remove hair, is because you don't want that baby to lose the heat by conduction, convection, radiation. And if you need to put the baby in a, a cot, especially if it's more for the children, you see the nurse put some hat or something around the head to prevent heat loss, and cover them with blanket and wrap them with a mother's cloth so that they don't lose heat. Because the surface area of their skin is relatively larger for their small body. Did I answer your question? Yes. I saw your hand was there. That was good. And therefore, you will find that we taught their teenagers full, healthy bodies, long bodies. That once they get pregnant, their placenta produces more progesterone relative to their work, to let's say the mother. And of course, that is what can be to uh, toxemia. Number two, toxemia now is being in fact seen to be an inflammatory condition. It's not just pregnancy. So if that mother and the teenager happens to have that's a pelvic inflammatory disease, which was not properly treated, sexually transmitted disease, which was not properly treated. And if you're talking about nine niece and cousins and nephews in the village, then they're even going to come to you when they have an itching, you know? To them, they're going to think that that's a couple of you know? They will just not take it easy. But what is happening is it's an infectious process. And you know you're some very infection you produce inflammatory protein. All these are part of the thing that you need to see. So it has to do with the biology of the person. It's not anything. It doesn't have to be the infection I'm talking about. But the answer to the true answer to your question is 
Problem. I know very well. I was born here. I grew up here. I still come here. So I know the problem. It's which is more cultural, poverty related, distant from your house and this and that. And they will tell you, people are telling you, and you're the ambulance. You know, I know all that. And don't forget to, in some rural areas, they don't see that as a problem. They still have, I'm sure you know, they still have uh, birth attendants or something like that. So that problem you have no control. The only thing you can do as a professional is the one who comes to you. That's all you can do. You cannot go into every bush and look for a family. Yes, the system that has been developed where you might have chicks come down, now the movie help them into the community may have solved the problem. But as the chicks come down and the other side they see a problem, send it to you in the health center, you send it to the other. But my friend, that's not you can do. If they don't come to you, as you say, you can't find them. Unless you send people on motorcycles to every house looking for people and dragging them to you, you can. My point is, if, if they happen to, to have had your message that is preached on the radio or the other women who are pregnant go home and tell them, oh, come on, that poor guy, I said, you know, those are them. That's all you can do. But I agree with you. And I'm not saying you're not. Uh, look at it. All of this one says health prevention. And health prevention in the sense that to, to, to prevent, you have to identify and recognize. And that's why when you do your antenatal assessment, you just see me talk about what you do. I, I know you're very fantastic, but as I said, I've seen the booklets. And everything is marked. All I'm just now trying to suggest to you is at the end of that visit, ask yourself, is this a high risk mother? Uh, if you say, nah, this is. Coco, no big deal. You can advise the mother to go home without problems. And we'll go home and sleep quietly. And then if you say, ah, she was A when I saw her at 12 weeks. It's now so A at 20 weeks. At 28 weeks, she's not having a bit of edema and a little bit of sugar. Ah, this is not the same pregnancy that I saw a month or two ago. Now that's a B. You have to ask yourself, am I okay in managing this patient? Okay, and that's fine. So that's the profession you're talking about. But yes, you can do anything unless they come to the hospital. 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 Come to that is the first question. Oh, third person. Oh, you better panic. <laughs> <laughs> you better panic, especially, especially if you know what happens to the other two babies. If the other two babies, any one of the two babies, was an RH positive, then mother's illness. Kill it. No questions asked. So that particular question is, is a problem. Think about it as well. You see, the first child is always jealous, right? That's what people are first born. They're jealous. <laughs> the little brothers and sisters come. So the first child comes in and immunizes the mother. And he's born perfectly well and happy. No problem. But he's creating a rough road for the rest of the world. <laughs> he doesn't like his brothers. He doesn't want our brothers and sisters. So he immunizes the mother. So the second person comes. And he is RH positive. Now, let's go back to basic immunology. You all do immunization of children. Why do you not just give them the first shot and that's the end? Why do you give them the second one? Why do you give them a second shot of uh, 
DPTM going right in to boost. They are boosting the antibodies. The third one boosts it even higher. Why? Because you want to create enough antibodies in that child that the day tetanus comes into him, uh, polio comes into him, or diphtheria comes into him, he has enough antibodies to get rid of us. So let's get back to your question. Uh, Baby number one is added positive, comes in, mother has never seen an added positive, okay? So he immunizes the mother, he puts out smiling. Baby number two comes, he's also added positive, right? Blood cells which are added positive are crossing into the mother. Yes, but that's the second shot, okay? So you boost the active this level, which could be enough to start causing trouble for that. That's why number three, start crying. <laughs> Because now the antibodies are boosted. Number three comes, unfortunately, and are is positive again. Fewer, the rest of start crossing to the mother. He's boosting the mother. By now, even worse, though, the mother already has antibodies and say, I saw you before, and I didn't get rid of you. You're going to get you this time. Because that's the minority. That's what you do with infection control. You know, if you can find all the infection, you'll never be sick. But that's why you immunize people, so that they can recognize the wild virus or the wild bacteria in person. So the answer to the question is yes. But let me get back to the answer I thought you had asked. I thought you said first pregnancy. And I said yes. And you might have shocked a few people. But this is the answer. She might have been pregnant before, but you didn't know that. Think about it this way. Thank God, me and this people, we don't menstruate. Yes. We don't. So we don't know this. But the woman has the period every month. Let's just take it that it's 28 days. Okay? You know your biology is 14 days before menstruation is ovulation. So unfortunately, she got pregnant before her next menstruation. So that's, that's 14 days before the due date for her menstrual period. It comes, and she doesn't menstruate. She's waiting, she's waiting, and waiting about 10 days to two weeks afterwards. Good, she menstruates. In her mind, she has menstruated. Okay? She's just about to get baby. Because she got pregnant the two weeks before. A very ovulation, between ovulation and her menstrual date, let's say, the week before, she had conceived. But the pregnancy was not significant enough for her to know that she was pregnant, that she's not having the symptoms and has nothing else. But then she gets menstruating a week or two after her proper menstruation date. And she would say, oh, my menstrual period was delayed. That's all. Right? Okay. <laughs> but she was pregnant. And what happened was she must have carried the fetus, which was incompatible in life. There must have been something wrong with that baby or that conception. And she aborted. Assuming that abortus was an added positive, she's already been exposed. And or, like it's no secret, and there are certain girls, especially they don't know who gets pregnant now, have an abortion somewhere. And when you meet them for the first time, they say, oh, no, 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 this is my first pregnancy. <laughs> I've never been pregnant in my whole life. You don't know that fact. So the answer is, even though that might be the first pregnancy, I think the message I'm giving is any woman who is average, negative, and pregnant, treat it with respect. The history may be accurate. She may have had an illegal abortion that you don't know about. She might have had a late menstrual period in the past that she has even forgotten about which could have been uh, a late pregnancy and a spontaneous uh, miscarriage and then everything else. Yes, I'm just going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you that. If the mother is supposed to be a unity, and is requiring to be a unity, so you can be given a part of it. And why is this a unity? You don't have to be a unity. I don't think it's absolutely correct. That's not a true statement. Just to put it in a sense, and those of you are getting ready to examine this, so I mean, you guys are not getting <laughs> Folic acid is only useful for preventing neural tube defects. You know, the ones that have the 
but they're not going to take a chance. So we have to make sure. Which may benefit us, it may never benefit us, but that's public health, you know? And so, you know, that's the answer to your question. Okay? <coughs> ten minutes is not. Huh? Is that ten minutes? That's a good one. Yeah, but yeah, ten minutes. Yeah. So, in the beginning, if you identify certain problems and solve them and treat them properly, if we cannot, we are in the healthcare services all over the world, if we cannot do much here and much here and much here, then really we are not going to achieve the millennium development goal. Because the 75% reduction in, in, in new natal mortality are accounted for by most of these which are present on Earth. And therefore, that first day, that first minute, that first hour is all that we can do to try and reduce this by keeping the baby warm, keeping intravenous blood going, make sure the blood sugar is fine. If the baby has a breathing problem, give you some respiratory support. You can do something about it by recognizing premature rupture of membranes, and that the membranes have ruptured. Or as one of the terms that I've been known that is using as leaky lipo. If you're leaky lipo, it's because there's a, a, a break in your membrane. There's a risk of infection. In case you're not aware, all of us, nobody is accepted in this room, including we the men. We have bacteria in our genitalia. Yes. It's a non-normal thing, but we need them. They are brothers and sisters. They are like our ecosystem. And the same thing in the lower third, the rectovaginal portion of the pregnant woman. Normal, healthy, nothing wrong, because we all have. We have what they call our own microbiome. All of us have millions and trillions of germs in and out of us. And we are happy because that's what we need to do. We need to have them. That's, that's part of our microbiome. Do you think that it's so what is it not the same for the same time? You could you ever hear? No, that's not the of your attempting to bag and no air is going in, so you need to adjust your mask, make sure that you're covering the nose and mouth. You may even need a change to a different size mask. Exactly you, might have had, you might have had a small mask on there. Right. So again, you adjust your mask, and if you still can't get air in, then you know, reposition the airway. Way down here, kinks off the airway, way up there. It's like a membrane curtain here. So if you do this, it's airway obstruction. If you do this, it's airway obstruction. <laughs> okay? So you don't want to help it extend the head. And you don't want to flex the head. That's why you saw Robin and Greg uh, in the went this way and then they started in bringing the head up. But they didn't do it like this. This is obstruction. Mm -hmm. You want it like you're smelling something. Yeah. Like, oh, you walk into the house and, oh, something smells good? That's the position you that's want the to position. be in. That's the position. Like, when you go home and you want to cook soup, <laughs> <laughs> so, mm -hmm. that's where, that's that's where you want your head to be. <laughs> it's like, if you can't say, no, it's not good. It doesn't smell good. <laughs>